Hi, my name is Alexander Gordon-Smith and it is a huge pleasure to be here on genebooknerd.com to kickstart my Fury blog tour. I want to say a huge thanks to Jean, it's wonderful to be back here, thank you so much for welcoming me back onto your blog, and an even huger thanks to all of you awesome book nerds out there, it's fantastic uh, to see so many of you and that you tuned in, thank you very much. So I was thinking that as this is the first stop on uh, my Fury blog tour to celebrate the publication of The Fury. <laughs> Um, that I would talk about beginnings and how important uh, the beginning of a book is. Now I am a hugely impatient reader, uh, I'm a really impatient writer too, um, but especially when I'm reading, if a book doesn't grab me straight away, um, I tend to kind of lose interest in it very quickly, which is terrible, I know, really bad habit to slip into, but I think things move so fast these days and books have to move so fast these days that, that people lose that patience that they once had with reading. Anyway, I'm the absolute worst at that, so a, a, a fast beginning uh, for a book, a book that really kind of reaches out and grabs you and pulls you in, is so important to me. Really important to me when I'm writing as well. Uh, writing the beginning of a, of a book is the, the best part for me, it's the part of writing that I enjoy most. That part where you kind of open the door uh, and you first have a glimpse of that world that lies on the other side and you know that, you know, once you've stepped out there you can go anywhere with it, you can do anything, you, you know, you can see anything. Um, it's an amazing experience, it's kind of addicted, I, I love that sense of adventure. Um, and it has to move fast, you know, when I write a book I want that first chapter to kind of pull me in as an author, I want it to just kind of grip, grip me, grab me even, and just kind of wrench me into the story. And I really don't want that story to let me go until the final page, um, which I think is why my books tend to be quite fast paced. One of my favourite books is George Orwell's 1984. In fact, it's my, you know, my favourite book of all time, and uh, I love the opening of that story. It was a bright, cold day in April, and the clocks were striking 13. Uh, absolutely wonderful. That, I remember that when I read that when I was younger, that drawing me into the story, just making me think, wow, what is this? You know, where is this book going to take me? So when I was writing The Fury, I knew right from the start that I wanted it to have a really, really powerful opening chapter. Um, something that nobody was really expecting. Um, I wanted that chapter to just grow grab people, to kind of abduct them into the story and not let them go until the end. And this is what I came up with. It was an ordinary Wednesday afternoon in June when the world came to kill Benny Milston. It was his birthday, his 15th. Not that anyone would have noticed. He sat in the corner of the living room in the tiny box of a house that he'd called home ever since his parents had split up three years earlier. His mum lay on the sofa, idly picking foam out of the holes the dog had made in the ancient fabric. She was staring at the TV over her huge stomach and between two sets of freshly painted toenails, her mouth open in an expression of awe and wonder, as if she was watching The Rapture, not Deal or No Deal. On the other side of the room, slouched in a wicker bucket chair, sat his sister Claire. She had once been his baby sister, until his actual baby sister, Alison, had arrived a year ago. The youngest Milson shuffled in her high chair in the door between the living room and the kitchen, smacking her dinner tray with a plastic spoon. Their dog, an elderly Jack Russell that he had named Crapper when he was a kid, sat under her, snapping half-heartedly at the spoon whenever it came close, but too old and too lazy to make a proper effort. Not one person had said happy birthday to him all day. This wasn't what was bugging Benny though. What was really starting to scare him was that nobody had even spoken to him all day. And it wasn't just today either. Strange things had been going on since last week. He couldn't put his finger on it exactly, he just knew that something was wrong. People had been treating him differently. He wasn't the most popular kid at school, not by a long shot, but in the last couple of days even the guys he'd called friends, Declan, Ollie, Jamie, had been ignoring him. Ignoring was the wrong word though, they talked to him, but it almost had been as if he wasn't really there, as if they were looking through him. And the stuff they said, we don't need any more players Benny, we're busy now Benny, goodbye Benny, had been downright nasty. They'd been treating him like they hated him. Things were no better at home either. His mum's vocabulary was usually limited to about 20 words, of which do it now, don't argue with me, and I'm busy were the most common. But this week he'd heard worse, much worse. Claire too was acting weird. She'd not said anything, but it was the way she glanced at him when she thought he wasn't watching. The way kids looked at strangers, at people they thought might be dangerous. She was doing it right now, he realised, staring at him. Her eyes dark, lined with suspicion, or maybe fear. As soon as he met them, she turned back to the television, pulling her legs up beneath her, crossing her arms across her chest. Benny felt the goosebumps erupt, his cheeks hot, but a cold current running through him. What the hell was going on? 
Benny reached up and rubbed his temples. His head was banging. It hadn't been right for a couple of days now, but what had started off as an irritating ringing in his ears now felt like somebody pounding the flesh of his brain with a meat tenderizer. And there was a definite rhythm to it, syncopated like a pulse. Thump, thump. Thump, thump. Thump, thump. Only it wasn't his pulse. It didn't match. If anything, it reminded him of somebody banging at a door, demanding to be let in. He'd taken a couple of aspirin when he'd gotten home from school an hour ago, but they barely made a difference. It was literally doing his head in. He realised Claire was glaring at him again. He pushed himself out of the armchair and his sister actually flinched, as if he'd been coming at her with a cricket bat. He opened his mouth to tell her it was okay, but nothing came out. The only sound in the room was that thumping pulse inside his head, like some giant turbine between his ears. Benny walked towards the kitchen, Claire's eyes on him. His mum was watching him too, her head still pointing at the TV, but her eyes swivelled so far round that the red flecked whites resembled crescent moons. He turned his back on them, squeezing past Alison's high chair. His baby sister stopped banging her spoon, her face twisting up in alarm. Don't cry, Benny whispered, reaching out to her, and the way she pushed back against her seat, her chubby fingers blanched with effort, broke his heart. She wasn't crying, she was too frightened to cry. That's when he felt it. Something in his head, an instinctive command that cut through the thunder of his migraine. Get out of here. Surging up from a part of his brain that lay far beneath the surface. Run. It was so powerful that he almost obeyed, his hand straying towards the back door. Then Crapper shuffled out from under Alison's high chair and limped over to him. The dog peered up with such kindness and trust that Benny couldn't help but smile. There you go, boy, Benny said, tickling the dog under his belly. You don't hate me, do you? And all of a sudden, the voice in his head was gone. Even the pounding roar slightly muted. Nothing was wrong. He was just having a bad week. That was all. Benny poked Crapper tenderly on his wet nose, then stood up, a head rush making the room cartwheel. He opened up the kitchen cabinet, searching the dusty shelf for a glass. It wasn't like normal was even a good thing, he thought as he filled the glass with water. Normal sucked. He took a deep swig, letting his eyes wander. Something on top of one of the cupboards hooked them, a scrap of colour peeking out from the shadows. Benny frowned and placed the glass on the counter. He scraped a chair across the floor and hoisted himself up, coming face to face with a rectangular box in crimson gift wrap. A ribbon had been carefully tied around it, topped with a bow. With a soft laugh, he reached out and scooped up the package. It was big and it was heavy, about the same kind of heavy as an Xbox might have been, and that's when the excitement really hit him, knotting up his guts. His mum had never ever bought him a console, not a PlayStation, not a Wii, not even so much as a DS but she'd always said he could have one when he was old enough. He'd never known just how old he'd have to be to be old enough, but now he did, 15. He leaped down from the chair, bundling the box into the living room, almost knocking Alison out of her high chair in the process. So that's what all this had been about, his mum and his sister teasing him, pretending they'd forgotten his birthday before surprising him with the sickest present ever, probably a 360 with Modern Warfare 3. Thanks, mum, Benny yelled, thumping back down in his chair with the box on his lap. There was a gift card under the loop of the bow, and he fumbled with it, his fingers numb with excitement. To Benny, at long last, maybe now you'll stop nagging us about it. Wishing you a really happy birthday. Lots and lots of love, mum, Claire and Alison. This is so cool, he said. I knew you were just kidding. His headache had gone too, he realised. That generator pulse now silent, obliterated by the unexpected turn the afternoon had taken. He tore at the thin paper, one rip causing it to slough to the floor. His mum had hefted her bolt from the sofa and was waddling towards him, arms out, and he waited for the hug. The slap made fireworks explode inside the living room, raging spots of colour that seemed to burn through his vision. He was rocked back into the chair, so shocked that the box tumbled off his lap, crunching onto the carpet. You'll break it, was the first thought that rifled through his head. Then the pain caught up, a flash of heat as if he'd been standing too close to the fire. There was no time for anything else before the second slap caught him on the other cheek, setting off a high-pitched ringing in his ears and making it feel as though his whole face were alight. He looked up, tears turning the room liquid. His mum was there, at least a blurred silhouette, the same shape as his mum. One arm held high, swooping down. Crack. This time it wasn't a slap, it was a punch. Benny's mind went black. Nothing there but the need to get away. He could taste something coppery and warm on his tongue. Blood. Panic catapulted him from the chair, and he pushed past his mum hard enough to shunt her backwards. She windmilled across the tiny patch of floor, striking the sofa, looking for a moment like she was about to do a top-heavy tumble, only just managing to catch herself. She grunted, the kind of noise a startled boar might make, and Benny looked into her piggy black eyes and saw absolutely nothing human there at all.
Mum, he tried to say, but the word wouldn't fit in his throat. She teetered, her bare feet doing a weird, silent tap dance until she found her balance. Then she threw herself at him. The air was full of noise, the heavy, wet rasps of his mum's breathing, and something else, a rising pitch, like a kettle coming to boil. It took Benny a split second to understand that his sister Claire was screaming. She climbed out of the chair so fast that he couldn't get out of her way, her body flapping into his, skinny arms locked around his neck. Then his mum hit them both, her momentum knocking them to the floor. Benny smacked his head on the carpet, seeing his mum falling on top of him, cutting out the light. Her weight was impossible, pinning him to the floor, refusing to let him breathe. He was enveloped in her smell, body odour and shampoo and the stench of nail polish. He lashed out, throwing everything at her, but he couldn't get any force behind his blows. And she was hitting him back, fleshy fists bouncing off his temple, his neck, his forehead. Something white-hot burrowed into his shoulder, but he couldn't turn his head to see what. This time the pain made him shriek, the cries muffled by the heft of his mother's chest. It isn't real, it isn't real, it isn't real, but he knew it was. He could see sparks flashing in the edges of his vision as his oxygen-starved brain misfired. And worse, so much worse, he could sense death here, his death, somewhere in the dark recesses of the shape on top of him. And that is the opening few pages of The Fury. It really doesn't get any better for poor Benny uh, towards the end of that chapter. And the rest of the book is hopefully non-stop horrific action, uh, which like I say, is exactly the way I, I like books to work, um, to grab you at the beginning and not let go of you until the end. I just want to say another huge thanks to Jean for letting me visit your blog. Uh, it's been wonderful, it's a real pleasure to be here. And I want to say another huge thanks to you guys uh, for tuning in, for listening. It's been a real pleasure talking to you as well. And if any of you have got your own favorite book openings from your books or from, uh, from books you've read, uh, let us know in the comments. I, I would love to hear them. Thanks again, everyone, and stay furious.